there comes a point in your life where you start to realize, man, was younger me that much of an idiot? Most have this epiphany when their past actions catch up to them in the present, such as realizing some dumb tomfoolery ended up costing them a scholarship or some such equivalency. Me, on the other hand, is recognizing that I never beat Pokemon Sapphire because I had the mental capacity of a gremlin and never knew that once a Pokemon runs out of PP, it can still struggle. The dreaded Silcoon slash Cascoon mirror match scarred me for life to the point that instead of completing Sapphire, I finished Ruby, which is just Sapphire with a different coat of paint or a new hat. Huh. Now that I think about this out loud for a hopefully jeering audience to point and laugh at, I do be dumb sometimes. Let's talk about Pokemon Sapphire. Like I think with a majority, Pokemon is probably at the top of everyone's list when it comes to naming mon-catching RPGs. It may not be the best, the down period of the 3DS haunting me like an abhorrent specter sucking the time right out of my fragile protoplasmic filament, but there were good times to be had. To this day, I still cite Black and White 1 and 2 as the best mainline games in the series closely followed by Colosseum and Gale of Darkness with these spin-offs that stick to tradition. Specifying it as such due to the likes of Conquest, Ranger, and Snap to name a few, each good in their own right, though I do have minor quibbles with each. Fuck you, Charizard and Steelix. If anything, I enjoy these spin-offs a bit more than the headlining features because of their relationship with experimentation. That and Shin Megami Tensei exists to fill the sour gap left behind the Dark Age and my separation from Pokemon in general. It's why I never complain about Pokemon to the degree as some people do when it comes to gameplay as I know alternatives are a reality. My issues with Pokemon have always been pacing and Game Freak's weird obsession with presenting a lack of effort or caring in their craft. How much of this can be said now after Arceus's swings and roundabouts? But there do come times I hanker to return to the wonderful world of Pokemon and beat down a couple of clowns fighting for the end of the world in some way if their main focus isn't just stealing Pokemon and becoming champion. And the R34, but that's neither here nor there. Seeing as I've already slightly covered the boom of Pokemon with my Snap review, though I will point out it was a passing mention due to how Jack and Beans was the focal point for Snap, I'll skip the more relevant times for Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, Gen 3. To ease into the discussion about Sapphire, I want to categorize Pokemon in the manner that it usually is. Generations. Starting with red, green, blue, and yellow, this makes Generation 1 or Gen 1 with the subsequent releases of Gold, Silver, and Crystal creating Gen 2. Both were, as of the time before Gen 3, locked to the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, Nintendo's venture into portable gaming that lived for longer than most consoles do, seeing life in 89 and death in 03. I'm not going to go further into the handhelds, my merging of the two non-verbally stating its relevance within this recount, as one of our key figures in this case the hardware was the brick successor, the Game Boy Advance. Now rumblings of the new handheld trace back to around 96 with a number of magazines chronicling the development for it. At this time, the Advance was dubbed Project Atlantis. From the June 1996 issue of Next Generation, having spoken with sources close to Nintendo, Next Generation has learned that the machine will release in at least one territory before the year's end. Project Atlantis features a low-capacity chip which will run the 3 by 2 inch color screen machine for up to 30 hours. Our sources claim that the machine will not be compatible with any other hardware currently available on the market. It isn't beyond the realms of possibility, however, that Project Atlantis is a spin-off of Nintendo's Virtual Boy. Time frame wise that speculation wasn't off the mark. The Virtual Boy graced the plebeians of the world in 95 to ridicule and scorn, and that's not even counting the bleeding eyes or migraines it caused. It was very much pushed out to pasture to make way for the 64, which I've already explained had its own foibles. Guessing that Nintendo wanted to rectify the failure of the Virtual Boy marketed as Nintendo's newest portable system seems quaint now as it wasn't until the 3DS where they kinda did. Kinda. That gives away what happened to Project Atlantis now, doesn't it? As just like the Lost City, it fell below the waves. 
Not entirely because the project wasn't going smoothly, but because of poor timing. In a letter to Electronic Gaming Monthly, the magazine passes along the knowledge that the reason for why the Atlantis never came out in 96 was because the Game Boy still holds 80% of the handheld market. NOA does not want to release a new portable just yet until the Game Boy's fires burn. Out. Part of the Virtual Boy's failure was that it was directly competing with the Game Boy, which had a proven track record and lacked the faults of the walking pair of eyes. Combating yourself is a generally stupid idea in the marketplace as well. At least I can say that personally speaking. Right? <laughs> Never mind my musings, there was a presentation held by Masato Kuahara at 2009's GDC where a bit more light was shown on why the Atlantis became myth. Via joystick, Kuahara says that the unnamed would-be Game Boy Color successor was in development in 95, 96, and based on a 32-bit ARM RISC processor. The system, which evidently stalled in development due to poor graphics performance, is most likely the fabled Nintendo Atlantis project. First real smatterings of the Game Boy Advance were first heard at the August 1999 Nintendo Space World Trade Show, a kinda who's who expo with a built-in mystique surrounding it. Earthbound 64 and the DD were teased at Space World, if that explains my hushed tones, but that's more because I don't want to continue bringing up the DD or Earthbound 64. An IGN staffer who attended the event had the following to say, after talking with a few key individuals, it seems that there are two Game Boy successors in the works. One, codenamed AGB or Advanced Game Boy, is an online connectable Game Boy Color system. The unit is essentially the Game Boy Color with the cellular wireless connection built into a single unit. The other talk is of a 32-bit color handheld, but from the individuals we talked with, this system is quite a ways off. Definitely something that sounds like it won't be ready until at least 2001. There really isn't any need for it yet, the Game Boy Color is still going strong and still fueling the Japanese company more than the Nintendo 64 is. Call this person Nostradamus as that prediction was correct, the Game Boy Advance being announced in 99, shown off in 2000, and released in 01. Relatively speaking, Pokemon Sapphire and Ruby's development was bog standard with developer Game Freak, director Junichi Masuda, and art director Ken Sugimori still at the wheel. However, with newer hardware allowed more creativity. In an interview with Computer and Video Games, Masuda answers a question regarding the Advance's increased memory capacity with what is new about the Game Boy Advance version is that it has made transmitting systems possible for four people all involved at one time. This means that four people can enjoy playing the game together at the same time. Also in Pokemon Ruby and Pokemon Sapphire, the graphics are new, and in this game new aspects have been included such as the Pokemon Contest. Yes, four players would be able to play at the same time through the Game Boy Advance's Link Cable system, allowing for a new battle type in the region of Hoenn double battles. Like with the previous worlds of Pokemon, Hoenn is steeped in both childhood memories and geographical reverence, the island nation of Hoenn based on the Kushi Island. However, memory was an issue for the team as not all ideas were finalized before the release. Masuda explains in the CVG interview that because the memory programs are limited, we couldn't add one aspect to this new game that we would have liked. We could not make one Pokemon make three sounds. For example, we would have liked Pikachu to make two different kinds of sounds. When he is happy, he may say Pika, but when he's feeling sad, he makes a little sound Pikachu. We wanted to make more different sounds. We wanted a Pokemon to create many different kinds of sounds depending on the feelings that Pokemon is having. Coming out in their usual two-version manner, the pair of Pokemon Sapphire and Pokemon Ruby first saw the light of day in late 2002 in Japan before touring the rest of the world in 2003. And this goes without mention, a completed version of the game in the form of Pokemon Emerald was placed onto store shelves in 04 and 05 respectively for Japan and the rest of the world. To this day, Sapphire and Ruby are cited as the highest selling games on the Game Boy Advance. Advance, with me and my brother adding to the numbers as he got Ruby and I Sapphire. I still own his copy of Ruby, but since DS capture cards are a bit fucky, I opted to use the Virtual Boy for my run of Sapphire. Take note that when you do this, time events can't happen as the battery pack is considered dry.
Okay, so the general outline of the Pokemon games is a bit unconducive to a step-by-step -step retelling. In short summary, you are a new resident to the region of Hoenn and town of Little Rue, and through sheer curiosity do you wind up going on an adventure to fill out a database called the Pokedex by catching and battling Pokemon, challenging the local gyms to become eligible for an organization called the Pokemon League so that you may beat the elite foreign champion of Hoenn, and stopping eco-terrorists from dooming the world via flooding in the case of Sapphire. Much of Pokemon's storytelling is either shown off towards the team encounters, Hoenn busying itself with a tale of environmental danger, or is diegetic in the sense that Pokemon battles and catching can be wildly different from someone else's experience. Take my duel with Kyogre. While another person might regale you with a short anecdote mentioning how they used the Master Ball, I would weave a tapestry detailing clever usage of Pokemon switching and Ultra Balls, a rough transitional period where I had to forego most of my team for breeding as my account alone dependent on a laundry list of factors that, sure, can match up with someone else's but play out wildly differently. This structure of story has largely gone unchallenged up until Black and White, which interweaves the various plot points together while still keeping true to this natural way of creating experiences. A clutch kill with a crit might be replaced with a tale of utter defeat and revaluation between persons. Every Pokemon journey is personalized to a degree, explaining why you can name the player character whatever you 
want. Pokemon itself is also not concerned with telling a greater story, at least at this point in its life. Most of what you get is drip-fed character interactions interspersed with battles that inform goals and outcomes. At best here, you have a typical Save the World plot with Team Aqua and Magma. Their ideals are informed by the world and an uninformed opinion about it, claiming that man and nature can't mix together despite Pokemon and people having a deep, intrinsic bond. People help Pokemon as they do people, forming a symbiotic relationship in its purest shape. It's by refusing to understand that tenement of the universe do the teams justify their actions in a twisted but explainable manner. Aqua and Magma have noble goals but short-sighted means, actively disrupting the balance of nature to the point of harming the ones they want to protect the Pokemon. This somewhat deeper philosophy would take purchase in the likes of Team Galactic's all-encompassing nihilism and Team Plasma's hypocritical dogma. Without Archie or Maxi playing the opposites of each other, we wouldn't have the crumbling power structure of In and Getsis that spills out into faction warfare like late 90s WWF. In my praise of Aqua and Magma, I will admit that they can come across as mustache-twirling evildoers, Archie and Maxi woefully inciting chaos instead of coming off as composed if flawed thinkers, but at the end of the day, it's a tiny wrinkle I can overlook. Having a good story or any in Pokemon is like having a vestigial yet working third arm. I already accomplished my tasks with the two I was given via cellular recombination and body mimicry. The third is just a bonus that I can show to other interdimensional horrors and house guests. While you would think I would start with the visuals, I'm actually going to begin with sound as, my god, I love the Hoenn sound font. Solid, digitized horns spearheading a bombastic OST with some of my favorite Pokemon tracks, such as Groudon and Kyogre's theme, the battle against the heads of Team Aqua and Magma, and the Elite Four battle theme, to name a few.
Sapphire has what I will call pump you up music where it elevates a simple idea into something grander than what it is, or in the case for when an event is already grandiose, push it to the nth degree. No better is that scene with the Deoxys theme, a slow starting but ravaging track that begets the otherworldly nature of the space virus. There's a lot of what I will call phenomenal opening notes that set the tone for a battle or area. The drumline for Groudon and Kyogre is appropriately heavy to enforce how catastrophic their awakening is to the world at large, with the menacing horns playing a duet to this overwhelming power. Same can be said for the Aqua Leader fight, though in particular the bass line on this track is quite thumping, showcasing that Hoenn isn't only about horns, though that is the main instrument and I wouldn't change it otherwise. In comparison, the overworld tracks are more jovial, capturing that sense of adventure even when certain loops are reused for some routes. The bike theme is ingrained into my memory due to my overuse of it, while Route 104's steady drumline always puts me into a good mood. Then there's all the jingles, which there are numerous of. Certain trainer themes are catchy as hell, while a lot of the other backing tracks set the scene something fierce. Strout and Drizzle, the songs that play after Groudon and Kyogre escape from the underground chasm, carry an air of unflinching dread, like, oh shit, the world is about to end if I don't get my butt into high gear and unfuck this situation pronto. Stepping away from the music, sound is something I think Pokemon gets right in general, with attacks having punchy effects or strange tones to audibly paint a picture of how weird, dangerous, or frightful Pokemon moves can be. The roar of compressed fire as it barrels towards an unsuspecting target, the rise of a wave as it crashes into a Pokemon, the bizarre whines as a mental barrage besets your opponent. It's all varied stuff along with the various cries of the Pokemon. It's hard to fault any of the sounds in this series besides one, the danger siren that blows out your eardrums harder than an x cloud with hyper voice. This isn't black and white, so no techno danger theme, just the most annoying tone you've ever heard in your life outside of Dumb and Dumber. Visually speaking, we're at the height of pixel graphics on the GBA. This is a mainline title with a game freak that cares at this point in time, so Hoenn is the logical evolution from the likes of Yellow and Crystal. Overworld sprites are delightfully chibi to keep to the origin of Pokemon being Tamagotchi, then bam, when in battle, fully detailed sprites that are static, yes, but capture each Pokemon well. Just by looking at the likes of Solomon's or Agron can I determine how powerful they are. While I can't shoot through every design, as Markiplier has already beaten me to that, a few of my favorites are the ones I just listed above, all three starters, Gardevoir for obvious reasons, Ludicolo, Shiftry, Swalot, Flygon, Metagross, all the legendaries of the region, and Feebas plus Milotic. There's a huge variety with a large set of inspirations, ranging to ancient history with the world trio of Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza with their glowing body lines, to mythological as Shiftry is a Tengu in Pokemon form, to early modern with Ludicolo's Sombrero Rain Dish. It is a pick and mix, as while I don't enjoy garlic ride chips, there's more than plenty to love. Trainers do get the shaft in this predicament, though at least the more important ones are visually striking and this isn't me saying that the humans look bad. There are full-on fan paces for NPC trainers for a reason, lest you forget the Hex Maniac boom. It's just that Pokemon are the focus and this isn't Colosseum where everyone looks like a total weirdo.
Pokemon Sapphire is a turn-based RPG with a heavy focus on raising and catching the eponymous creatures to build a team capable of taking on all comers. Heads up for this entire section, don't ask me about EVs or IVs. I play Pokemon on a casual level, thus while I know what makes for a good Pokemon moveset, hell if I know what a good nature is for one or how to determine the hidden stats. I go with the flow. Starting off right with the difficulty, Sapphire lacks a selection, though I will proclaim that the Hoenn region is a wee bit on the harder side. Regularly was I outleveled by the NPCs, doubly so if they were specific ones like gym leaders, rivals, or league trainers, but despite the gap in levels, skill plays a heavier part in the late game of Sapphire than higher numbers. As long as you're within a 6 level range, you'll do fine as long as you haven't been huffing glue or playing Simon Says with your brainstem. Beginning a new journey in Pokemon Sapphire sees you pick your gender as either Brandon or May, the two official names for Hoenn Star Trainers, and play through a tiny prologue where you can pick your starter of Torchic, Trico, or Mudkip. Their typings are the traditional trio of Fire, Water, and Grass in that order, opening me up to talk about Pokemon right now as this is the meat and potatoes of the game series. Each Pokemon comes with a set type that may or may not change during evolution if a Pokemon is capable of it, a number of stats ranging from health, attack, special attack, defense, special defense, speed, a nature that I think determines certain stat growth, this is me not knowing IVs and EVs, and an ability that has utility effects in and possibly out of combat. All Pokemon are typed and have advantages and disadvantages against others. As the layman says, rock, paper, scissors. Water beats fire, which beats grass, which beats water. Got it? Good. There are 17 different typings in Hoenn, and some Pokemon can be dual typed, such as normal flying or dragon ground, meaning you always have to balance out or calculate advantages and disadvantages throughout your whole adventure. Now why do you want to do this? Super effective damage. When a Pokemon is hit with its weakness, it can take double or quadruple the damage, such as water versus fire or ground versus rock steel. On the flip side, not very effective moves deal a half to a fourth of the damage, with stab damage calculated if a Pokemon used a move of its same typing. A Machamp using Brick Break does more damage than an Armaldo with the same move due to Stab. Pokemon can only have four moves at a time, so you usually want to balance out Stab attacks with defensive options or coverage so a Pokemon can either fit into a role on your team of six or to be useful against any typing. Moves run on PP, which there is a finite amount of for each move, and when it runs out, a move is no longer usable in a battle and can only be replenished with specialized items or by going to a Pokemon Center which also heals Pokemon of any status ailments like Poison and Burn, and brings them back up to full health for free. Be careful when picking moves, as when a Pokemon does level up after earning experience from beating other Pokemon or simply dipping into a fight, it has the potential to learn new moves. Leveling up also increases stats. There are also items called TMs and HMs that can be given to Pokemon to learn new moves, but there is a detriment to doing this. TMs are one-time items, so you better make sure that you want to use one, while HM moves can't be forgotten except at the move deleter. HMs have a bit to play in traversing the region of Hoenn, but more on that later when I get to the world structure. Whenever a Pokemon runs out of PP for all moves, it can still struggle at the cost of recoil damage. When a Pokemon runs out of health, it faints, forcing you to switch Pokemon if you have any left, ending the battle if you or your opponent have none left, or ending the encounter if you do so to a wild Pokemon. I hope this isn't as strenuous as it seems because this is a lot to unpack in this style of video, and it all blends together at times. For a quick rundown of the stats, health is health. The more you have, the more damage a Pokemon can theoretically take. Attack determines physical power of so-called physical attacks such as Fly or Earthquake. Special attack does the same except for special attacks like with Shadow Ball or Crunch. Defense and Special Defense determine damage reduction against the opposing attack specified, and speed is how fast you move. Pokemon as a whole widely prioritize specific stats, with fighting types favoring attack and defense, while psychics special attack and special defense. While you are given your first Pokemon for free, you have to catch others by walking into tall grass, or an equivalent overworld space, 
and pummeling a wild Pokemon to near death, then throwing Pokeballs at it until either you catch it or it knocks itself out via struggling. There is a catch rate to wild Pokemon and different Pokeballs better your odds either outright or under certain conditions, but the best way to catch is what I outlined above and using status effects like sleep, paralysis, or frozen as it bumps up your odds. Catching a Pokemon registers it to the Pokedex, as does evolving and trading for new Pokemon. If you have an empty space in your team, the caught Pokemon goes directly into an empty slot, Otherwise, it is transported to a PC where you have to reorder who's who in your squad. Some last tidbits for catching and evolving Pokemon, not all are capable of being seen in Sapphire. Exclusive Pokemon do exist between versions, and some evolutions can only be acquired via trading. The Safari Zone does crop up here in Hoenn with previous generations Pokemon, and has a whole different system for catching based on Pokeblocks made from berries, and what could be best described as abstract RNG frustration. There is RNG anyway when it comes to making certain Pokemon show up outside of the zone, as while Skarmory is an encounter in the Ash Fields, his appearance rate is lower than Spindas and Sandshrews. Legendaries are exceedingly rare Pokemon that usually show up during story events, and only one exists. If you knock it out, it's gone forever. While Pokeballs can be found out in the overworld or by talking to people, alongside various other items like the held items that add further abilities to your Pokemon, such as strengthening moves of a type, to earning you more money, you will need to buy most of your gear from Pokemarts that steadily add to their inventory the further you go along in Sapphire. Potions become Super Potions up to the full restore, while Pokeballs to Great and Ultra Balls. Revives to revive a fainted Pokemon in your party in case a Pokemon Center is too far away. Some stores have unique items to sell as well, so depending on what you need, you might have to do some traveling. Money doesn't grow on trees in Pokemon. The fastest way to earn that cheddar is by beating other trainers in legalized dogfights called battles. Unlike with wild Pokemon, you can't run away, which is determined by level and the speed stat, so expect to get trapped by Golbat in the late game even with repels. Battles are turn-based affairs where you pick a move from your allotted move pool of whatever Pokemon is out in front and hope that your stats are better than your opponents and you have the type advantage. Striking first can be an important play in battles, as being on the back foot means you might have to shuffle out a different Pokemon on your first turn. The Pokemon on the leftmost side of the team screen is the one who gets thrown out first, or heal, allowing your opponent was ostensibly a free turn if the AI doesn't bork itself by hitting you with a move that does no damage, or by failed cherry tapping. Double battles are the same, just with two Pokemon out in front instead of one, though when a Pokemon faints, it can turn into a handicap match and a few moves hit everyone or just the enemy team. Looking at you, Earthquake. Trainers come in all different flavors, though they are divided by NPC, so all bug catchers and maniacs will use bugs, while fishermen and swimmers water. God forbid you lose against the AI as you white out, which means you get robbed of Dosh and sent back to the nearest Pokemon Center. This has never happened to me in all my years I've played Pokemon offline, so yeah. Trainers can be rematched, but only after you get the Poke Nav and after spending 255 steps in a route where a trainer wants to rematch you, though there is only a 31% chance of a rematch being asked for after the steps. Pokemon Sapphire's structure sees you travel from route to route heading to the various gems to unlock HM so you continue the process while possibly dealing with Team Aqua's nonsense during set pieces. This all culminates in a few boss fights against Team Aqua admins, their leader, your rivals, and the Pokemon League. Gem leaders serve as progression, so most of the time when you enter a new town with one, you want to immediately challenge it to raise your level handling cap. Pokemon stop obeying commands at certain levels if you don't have prerequisite badges be able to use HMs on the overworld so that you can reach more gems, and generally progress the game. Gems are numbered and you can't tackle them out of order. Outside of this loop, there are optional locations and dungeons accessible by HMs that grant new Pokemon or items for you to use. Any of these dungeons might have a pushing puzzle or some obstacle to circumvent with HMs. A key mechanic in Pokemon is that you can breed the monsters, but only after you reach Mauville. Breeding is done at the daycare where you put a female Pokemon of an egg type and a male Pokemon of that same egg type to hopefully breed a better version of the female Pokemon. This is done to cycle out IVs, EVs, or breed moves onto Pokemon that don't naturally learn them, as with the case of Lotad and Leech Seed. Breeding takes time and effort, with the two Pokemon either liking each other and breeding quickly, 
or not and breeding slowly, then with the egg, you have to walk a total number of steps to hatch it. Biking makes this easier as it is faster than walking and tangent. There are a few overworld items that help you either move faster or catch Pokemon. This is also how you acquire shinies easier potentially with a shiny Pokemon being an oddly colored palette swap of a regular Pokemon that determines a sort of virtual prestige. I caught a shiny Abra with a primer ball on my physical copy of Ruby a long time ago, and I still have them in black too, so nothing will ever be as hype as that. There are also the side activities of contests, secret forts, the battle tower, as well as post-game content after beating the Elite Four and Champion, but I could be here all day listing this stuff out. Pokemon Sapphire is a game of one save file, as in when you save, that is the only save slot you have. Starting a new game means overwriting that save. You can save whenever as long as you can pause the game and pausing the game grants you access to your bag that has limited space, your trainer card, and your team. If I am leaving anything out, I either forgot about it as there is a lot to cover or I didn't determine it to be important my run through Sapphire like with trading as the GBA link cable no longer has a meaningful function on this earth. As it comes with the territory, the Pokemon are at the forefront, and as such, I will list out some of my favorites. Starting with starters, Hoenn's iconic trio might be the first instance in the franchise where each starter is good in its own right. Venusaur and Magnadium are always the weakest out of their respective gens. Both languishing with balanced stats and saddled with a focus on status effects, but without the will to hold on. Muck was always a better toxic thrower and any thunder type resonant wall Magneton says hello could plink away with thunder wave leaving poison powder and stun spore in the wind. Skeptile bucks the trend, hitting hard and fast as a quick special attacker with access to a wide range of damaging move types. Able to learn Leech Seed and Toxic, Skeptile's high agility ensures a nasty surprise if you haven't specced into a traditional stall wall. Or you can run Dragon Claw, Iron Tail, Brick Break, or Aerial Ace for coverage and slight utility. He's the first real phenomenal grass starter, and his lizard like design is a definite favorite of mine. Meanwhile, Blaziken keeps to the fire starter mindset of high attack, low defense, while inventing a long running philosophy for fire starters going into the future fire fighting. Fighting types for the longest time always got the shortest end of the stick solely because there weren't many and that they required you to trade for them. Machamp's beefy muscles could only be used if you invested into trading, which not all of us had the capability of doing so. That left your only preferred alternatives, sorry Primeape, as Hitmonlee, Chan, Top, and Polyrath. The former three pretty alright on their own, with the latter a bit of a bust compared to Politoed. Blaziken not only adds diversity to the struggling fighting types, much like Polyrath, but it cements itself as a solid sweeper with high coverage. Nine times out of ten, it will go first with a torrent of blows with the likes of the high critical ratio Blaze Kick, the Fly Catch and Sky Uppercut, or any coverage move like Aerial Ace or Earthquake. The only issues pertaining to the chicken is that like with a lot of fire type starters and fighting types in general, Blaziken can dish it out while not being able to take it. But when your target is dead in one hit, that's not so much of a problem. Rounding out the trilogy, my favorite is the spongy tank Swampert. I don't know what the design process was for coming up with him, but Game Freak literally decided to put all their backing into the Mudfish since it has relatively higher stats besides speed and easy access to strong moves such as Surf, Ice Beam, Earthquake, Brick Break, among others. Oh, and Rain Dance, cooperating with Torrent and any held items to further bolster hard-hitting water moves. A decked out Swamper is the equivalent of the Terminator, the only downside of the big boy being its poor dual typing of water ground, granting water attacks a bit of leeway and allowing grass to soak up the groundwater after a downpour. But while Rain Dance might have a place for your Swampert, I prefer it on Ludicolo. When it isn't dancing around like the jolliest sombrero wearing sprout that it is, Ludicolo is effectively stonewalling any opponent that can't penetrate its hard HP game. While needing to put in the work to have a sucker, as Lotad doesn't naturally learn Leech Seed and can have the ability of Swift Swim, which isn't bad and has a purpose on the more attack variant Ludicolos instead of Raindish, once it has been finalized, 
a life gain Ludicolo can make bank off of both stalling and damage. Add Surf in your choice of Mega or Giga Drain and congratulations, if Ludicolo doesn't go down in one hit, it will stay there dancing in the rain until your opponent calls it quits. The lack of speed is Ludicolo's one weakness, but once he starts going, it's hard for him to stop. While I've predicated this section for the most part by presenting Pokemon that function well by themselves, Pokemon is a game about strategy even if the main games don't take full advantage of it. Just play online to know what I'm talking about. Our next star facilitates a team effort, as Sableye functions as an annoying little gremlin that harasses with flinching attacks and status effects. Fake Out serves a dual purpose, scoring a free hit once Sableye has been shifted in and allowing Toxic, Leech Seed, or Sandstorm to do business, or if spikes have been laid out, catch a weakened Pokemon off guard. Detect serves the same goal, wasting time for Weather, Leech, or Poison to finish the job while dropping Confuse Ray to further halt attacks. Transitional is Sableye's playstyle, having the lauded and infamous Dark Ghost typing, winning matchups against his brethren while protecting against super effective damage. The only issue pertaining to Sableye is its low stat growth as it doesn't evolve and outside of SE and stab damage, Sableye proves to be middling attack-wise. Sableye's biggest friend in my party was the appropriately Tubby Swalon, a singular poison type with natural access to amnesia and receiving acid armor when bred with a Grimer or Muck that knows the move. A traditional wall in the Pokemon sense, Swalot's lower speed bellies its higher defense values, bolstered by amnesia and acid armor to the point of surviving poor matchups. Taking an earthquake to the face with minimal scarring is hilarious, especially when dosing your unsuspecting foe with a heaping of toxic. And if that wasn't funny enough, running Shadow Ball as Swalot's special attack is greater than its physical, catches Psychic type sideways, leaving only Ground and Steel Pokemon to be the only true threats to Swalot's safety. It is let down by its lackluster abilities, Liquid Ooze pour on a Poison type as Grass will try to stay away, and Sticky Hold seeing relevance only online, but that swings in roundabouts. Flying types have always been one of my least favorites for generally being made up of the ever so ubiquitous duo of normal flying. Besides Staraptor's killer moveset of close combat and Brave Bird, I prefer alternatives to what I call a boring typing. While not unique to Hoenn, Skarmory still sits atop a mountain of spikes to prove its superiority to other flyers, reaching speeds that rival Blaziken's Skarmory's status as an attack-oriented wall is not to be understated, delivering hit after punishing hit with the likes of Flying Steel Wing while providing group benefits with Sandstorm and Spikes. It's hard to remove the bugger off the field, and even if a solid enough hit lands on Skarmory, one-shots are staggered by Sturdy, allowing at least two stacks of Spikes to drain health. And in my case, my Skormory had the tendency to land crits, Pokemon's equivalent of extra damage that bypasses stat-increasing moves like No Tomorrow, barreling through tough encounters or ensuring a kill at mid-range health. What truly rusts the metal is Skormory's lack of diversity, serving as a metal and flying attack slinger, but it does that job so well while still packing utilitarian purposes that it's more an oversight than anything else. Lastly for my team, there were a few candidates I had to choose from. Cast form was my immediate first consideration, taking advantage of the weather-centric playstyle my team dabbled with, but I decided against it as I would undoubtedly be subject to it when using the weather Pokemon as he would need to specialize in ice moves with hail, superseding the likes of rain dance or sandstorm at inopportune times plus an ever-changing type made it hard to juggle. One of the many dragons caught my eye, having used all three of Hoenn's in the past, but then I'd be heading down roads already traveled. Alteria, a wall, Solomon's, and Flygon sweepers. Good in their own rights, but double dipping isn't my style with all three assuming the role of the flyer. Guard of War fell to Skyrim reasoning, the poster girl for Pokemon R34 easily slotting in with light screen and reflect for party-wide protection alongside hard-hitting moves like Psychic and Shadow Ball, but is so vanilla when it comes to playing Hoenn, like choosing to be a stealth archer in Todd's magnum opus. Glalai would have made for an interesting choice, but it's tucked away in the ice caverns that I didn't bother with it. Strapped for a single spot, I threw Armaldo's name into the ring, and while he definitely suffers from Hoenn's lack of moves, no X-Scissor, 
His hulking frame plus wide selection of move types presents an interesting handyman. With Water Pulse to snuff out fire and win the mirror match against rock and ground to brick break splintering normal types and cracking light screen and reflect to aerial ace slicing up fighting bug and grass, Armaldo can hit most Pokemon where it hurts with ease. Backing up this greater move pool is high attack and battle armor, shutting down criticals to keep him in the field longer. All that dampers Amaldo is his sluggishness, which the Quick Claw can alleviate to hilarious degrees. Rock Tomb gets stab damage as well as its speed debuff, providing another alternative to the problem. And yet, I haven't even gotten to the greatest part about Sapphire and Pokemon as a whole. This was just my team. I employed what could be considered pro-ish strats, but that might not be the case for you. Perhaps you want to use a team of all cool looking Pokemon, or maybe you want to challenge yourself by using considered weaker Pokemon. The choice is literally yours. Team building is as limited as your imagination and what Pokemon exist in the region, so go nuts. One man's trash is another's treasure, and you can only truly grasp what works by experimenting. Attack types are much easier to understand, and that's why breeding is a function, both in the casual and meta sense. I know Bubkiss about IVs and EVs, but I know I can transfer moves via breeding, perfecting a moveset for a specific function. You can invest as little or as much as you want in your team, granting either a serene or hardcore experience determined by what you want to do. Where Hoenn does shine in the battle department is that fights are challenging to a degree. Named NPCs, as in the bosses, do carry an aura of danger around them. Multiple times within Sapphire can you be stomped flat if you aren't paying attention. From Brawly onward, Hoenn expects you to take its difficulty seriously, which is commendable in this franchise, but doesn't hold you underneath the rampaging torrent. If grinding is necessary, Trainer's Eyes pairs up well with breeding and egg hatching while providing enough funds to not only pay off the daycare triple fold, but provide a means to purchase vitamins to further enhance your team's stats. Almost everything you can employ feeds into itself, with the only detriment being technically self-inflicted if you are determined for perfect IVs, EVs, natures, or shinies. Establishing this idea more is that the island of Hoenn is basically interconnected. Outside one early area and the ending locations, the main landmass is brilliantly interwoven, many routes leading or exiting out of old or new ones. It provides the sense of, oh, I know where to go next as I just unlock this new HM. Mallville acts as this hub as all of Hoenn passes through it and the adjacent routes. It makes the island that extra bit cozier that I didn't get from the ocean portions of the game. Capping off this section as I can't logistically go through each and every Pokemon, route, or battle, I'll cherry pick some of my favorite moments. First off, despite my reluctance to engage with the mechanic, contests do add welcome depth to the series. We're supposed to be raising Pokemon, so it didn't make a lot of sense that all we could do with them is battle. Contests rectify this, and the systems for performing well in them are thought out to a high degree. Double battles, while sparse in Hoenn, and I'll get to that, are an engaging inclusion that amplifies the whole team building exercise to a logical zenith. My favorite one of these fights being the Moss Deep Gym Leaders battle that tasks the player against a probably higher level duo of rock psychics that pair well together. Out of all the gym leaders, it's these two and Wallace I remember the most, providing plentiful challenge at their points in the game. The end game of the main story pivots away from the usual team nonsense into world-ending calamity, expressing how dangerous legendaries actually are in the universe. This would pave the road for Black and White 2's town freezing event, so I have to give a mention here. Legendary-wise, Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza have an intriguing dynamic, the elements of water, ground, and air balancing each other out so that the world doesn't get plunged into chaos. Likewise, Rayquaza and Deoxys' antagonism is equally enjoyable, this Sky Dragon running interference against the space virus. Then there's Jirachi, who I think is an underappreciated Pokemon, having a cute design while being existentially terrifying. A lot of what can be linked to the later entries can be traced back to Hoenn, but that in and of itself is a double-edged sword. <laughs> G 
Gee, I sure do hope I don't kill my own credibility by agreeing with IGN when it comes to their criticism regarding how much water is in Hoenn. That would paint me as a soaking wet clown who should have used the makeup gun. While decrying 7.8 too much water as a meme is like standing on the same ground as Obi-Wan posed to strike idiocy right out of the air, Hoenn does suffer issues with the way it handles water. That's a capital W as in the matter and the type. Despite many a route consisting of H2O, there is a clear lack of wanting to showcase it. What do I mean? How many trainers come at you with a collection of Wingull, Tentacool, and Whalmer? In my restless dreams, I see those three as they helplessly get pummeled under the likes of my Ludicolo or Skarmory. Occasionally, you might get lucky and spot a Sea King. Fuck yeah or Sveal, but the majority of water-type trainers carry that unholy trio, even though Hoenn is home to around damn near 60 water Pokemon. Variety is the spice of life, but it's drowned in a literal sea or absorbed by a plant. Making these matters worse is that a number of water trainers are basically gimme fights. My distaste for Pelipper doesn't come from a deep-seated anguish, but because anytime he's fielded as an opponent, he's a time sink. For some idiotic reason, any AI Pelipper will have this moveset. Mist, Protect, Stockpile, and Swallow. Now, if this was ranked Pokemon, some ladder goblin would tell me to shut up as they exclaim how great of a stall build that is. But since this is the AI I'm covering, my patience wears thinner than the ice of Wallace's gym as I'm led once again to employing my own strategy of waiting for it to melt. Even if I were to one-shot the Pelipper, the issue still stands that a number of fights are against helpless punching bags that offer no resistance. I don't know, man, maybe just swap out the lame birds with a Relkanath, a Corsola, a Surskit, hell, Corfish and Barboach exist but get shuntered off by the three-piece gang. Carvana is right up there as well, pulling double duty for swimmers and drowners alike, but at least Team Aqua only occasionally bobs for air with their infrequent encounters. Flowing with the current is exactly that, picking a direction and heading that way. No design, no structure, nada. In the words of Tisnakera, the sea is boring. Visit the unique sites of literally nothing. Mainland Hoenn has more going on with a veritable smorgasbord of paths interweaving the natural world with the one of man. Mount Pyre with its cable cars that overlook a desert and field of ash to Route 110 and its high and low paths are a few of the legitimately great areas in Hoenn, so it's a shame that the trademark of the region is so blandly utilized. The only locations that come to mind out at sea are the abandoned ship, Sky Tower, and the Ice Cave, all fleeting moments lost like tears in the waves. Not even the underwater sections are all that interesting due to a lack of, well, anything. Compounding the nautical nonsense, a minimum of two HM slaves are required for you to reach the end. One land-focused, the other sea. HMs are already contentious enough as is, outright throwing a monkey wrench into any team composition you strive to aim for, but with the amount that there are, a single slave won't be enough. Linoon can't learn the critical moves of waterfall and dive, thus unless you want to run two in a party, your water-focused HM slave must have rock smash and strength to circumvent those applicable obstacles. Luckily, Lombre is a versatile Pokemon, but that only counts for Sapphire and Emerald, and it's not like the HM moves are the best either. Fly, Surf, and Strength are worthwhile attacks aided by stab damage, held items, or buffs, but all the rest might as well be the equivalent of poking your opponent to death. You don't equip an HM because you love the move or think it adds depth to a team. You do so for arbitrary reasons that were shockingly commonplace for an ungodly amount of time. Flash's inclusion is a full-on meme as there's nothing preventing you from feeling your way around any dark cave, and there's only like two. There's also an invention called the internet granting you the floor plan of any dungeon. To circle back to an issue that I brought up before, team composition in Hoenn is a bit whack. I don't know if Game Freak rested on their laurels for this one, but a number of prominent trainers have a terrible case of the duplicates. Flaneri has two Slugmas, Norman two Slackings, Phoebe two Baynets, and Dusclops, Glacia two Celio and Glyle, and Drake two Flygons. Outside the obvious Pokemon type limitations, why? Especially for Flaneri and Norman, as apparently neither Nummel or Wismer evolutions exist. 
Drake could have had a Kingdra instead of double dipping and same to Phoebe, replacing a Dusclops or Banette with Sheninja. There's a clear laziness on display when it comes to diversifying the bosses. Another odd wrinkle is what I call evolution skipping. A few notable fights have this problem, mainly the rival ones, as for the longest time they will have a Pokemon that should be evolved, but isn't. Like, oh no, a level 30 Shroomish when it should have been a Breloom 7 levels ago. Puchiana is another usual suspect, Team Aqua members in both the HQ and Undersea Cave, rocking late 20 to early 30 level ones. I could maybe understand if an under-evolved Pokemon served a beneficial purpose to the team, but that isn't the case now, is it? It's another one of those mysteries that plague Hoenn, much like the inclusion of two bike types forcing backtracking. It would be a common sense idea to have the two bikes accessible by allowing the player to switch gears, but that is absent for whatever reason and like with a number of other ideas not implemented well into the game. The amount of times where the acro bike is needed are relatively few, the mock bike seeing more usage in puzzles and utility. It's like Game Freak didn't want to pull the trigger, something Double Battles suffer from. In total, there are only about 10 in the game, not counting the inner viewer rematches, what could be expanded into a more in-depth team exercise looking at Colosseum and Gale barely gets screen time. We know now that Game Freak is a fan of plopping down ideas and systems and completely forgetting about them, see triple and rotation battles, but that doesn't excuse how this slight tweak just gets thrown in like a lot of the other design work and left to sink. <laughs> Oddity is the name of the game as now I move over to moves. While I did say earlier that move typings are easier to determine in this game with attack and special serving as a nice system, this doesn't apply to every move. A number of dark type moves are the main offenders with the likes of crunch and feint attack considered special attacks when going forward they would be physical. I only know this because Swalot rocks both acid armor and amnesia, with damaging not lessening after one stack of armor, but doing so with amnesia. Perhaps the biggest complaint I could make within Hoenn is the ridiculous Reggie Trio side quest, requiring knowledge of Braille from the player. It might be the most egregious moment within the entirety of Pokemon for wholly stupid reasons, as it wasn't bad enough needing to understand the silent language, the Pokemon of Relkanaf and Walor are also necessary to release the Regis. Whalmer only evolves at level 40, a heavy time investment for any Pokemon, but it stings more since the float Pokemon just isn't that good. Relkanaf, meanwhile, is a rare undersea Pokemon that will annoy you with its low appearance rate. For comparison, Skarmory has about the same encounter rate and it took me almost an hour to finally find one. And like with its bombastic counterpart, Relkanaf is Dexfeller, having the malign typing of water rock. The Regis themselves aren't the most challenging of captures, all three suffering from the hands of a Blaziken or Swampert, adding even more confusion to the amount of hoop jumping that is needed to unlock them. Besides Reggie Ice, they aren't that spectacular either labored with middling stat growth or better alternatives in the same type pool. If this wasn't enough, and because I was deep into Pokemon to the point I did this, all three are important to catching Reggie Gigas and Sinnoh by way of transferring via the Pal Park. Continuing with catching Pokemon, the local Fleer is always one of the most annoying catches, Latias proving to be the worst simply by having her first appearance be randomized. For as hard as the flagship legendaries are to catch in Hoenn, as they do put up quite a fight, Getting that first encounter with Latias and Latios is hair-pulling and aggravating to the point I either don't bother or save the Master Ball so my headache can end quicker. While not to the heights of Pokemon Black and White or even Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum, Sapphire and the Hoenn region sit somewhere in the middle of the franchise. Hoenn makes definite strides towards codifying Pokemon, making attack types somewhat easier to understand and all around smoothing out the quirks of Gen 1 and 2, but for each step forward is a step back. Hoenn's selection of Pokemon is neat, but there is an overabundance of water types that rarely see the stage. Mainland Hoenn is a wonderfully interconnected island compared to the soporific and boring ocean lanes. Battles run the gamut from interesting and challenging to facing off against a parade of duplicates. Contests are fully realized while double battles are few and far between. As such, I can recommend Hoenn, but not as strongly as I would Sinnoh or Unova. <laughs> <laughs> 
sorry this took so long to come out. The start of April was an ass kicker for me, my doctor putting me on new medication that knocked the wind out of my cells for that first week. It also doesn't help that Pokemon is my first traditional RPG, unlike Bloodborne's blending, which incidentally is easier to cover. On average, too, it's quicker for me to blow through Bloodborne or a Soulsborne game than a standard RPG. Now you know why I don't go out of my way to cover these too often, as it makes it seem like I've abandoned my channel. God forbid I trek through Persona 3. This showing of Pokemon Sapphire is over, but stay tuned for our next feature involving the aftermath of Revenge, a comic book hero, and one of the worst PC ports I've had the displeasure of getting running.